Dear Nature, I have always loved the unknowns of you, but can we ever truly be together? Yours, John. Dear Nature, it's been a while but I feel moved to say how sorry I am that our relationship has become so problematic in recent times. It seems us humans have been affecting your effects for many years now. I think we always wanted to control your wonder to our benefit. But to realise the agents of such control may lead to our extinction has confused and unsettled our relationship with you. What to do? Yours, John. Dear Nature, we have been lovers. We made deities from your wonders. We worshipped you, laid our fears at your feet. We thought that we needed you to need us, but wasn't that just some way of seeking control? Maybe we find it hard to accept that you are the most powerful and complex set of relationships we can encounter. Perhaps we got jealous of all your other affairs. In our rush to evolve with our fights and flights, we've got lost amongst our own conceits. Spinning such a terrible storm. I'm sorry. What to do? Yours, John. Dear Nature, In the beginning farming was our evolutionary way. It fed us. We learn how to work your soils and follow your seasons. We tried so hard to acknowledge your amazing ways. Ritual after ritual constructed to try to guarantee your consistency, a courtship of a kind, even love of a sort. But love dulls. We slowly forgot you in our fewer to move on. So many clearing so much damage. Our conceit has been our desire for you to need us, to rule over you. When such a desire seems to be reproached, it troubles our self-esteem an unrequited desire. All along we so wanted you to need us, perhaps we could not bear the thought that we needed you but you didn't need us. We want to be loved. Yours, John. Dear Nature, in truth we slowly ignored you as our need for something greater than ourselves evolved the narratives and rituals of our religions. We could only find some sort of trust in reflections of ourselves. But these are going now, and we're left in the strangest nihilism without purpose and feeling, disconnected. If only we had understood that you were greater than we are. I think we needed to be needed for something, but forgot where we were. Yours, trying to navigate our relationship, John. Dear Nature, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is my guilt and worry. We have filled the earth. We have subdued it. We do rule over it. What is the cost to ourselves of subduing all that we seem to encounter? Yours is a vast history. Ours is a blink in that history. Perhaps that's where the hope lies in our geological youth. We are young and still learning. I'm sorry. Yours, John. Dear God, I have been writing to nature. Forgive my bluntness, but do your teachings help us to form a relationship with nature, or are they simply about us? I am perplexed with the sentiments of rule and subdue that is talked of in your scripture. Isn't this unhelpful? Yours, John. Dear Nature, I write to you on the understanding that I see you as a physical entity that causes and regulates phenomena in the world. I am sure that, as a species, we want our culture to take place of you, a desire for the sovereignty over the world to become the entity that causes and regulates phenomena in the world. It is a sad truth that we have affected you, a tragic consequence of our desire. It is even sadder if we think these effects are credence in our claim of sovereignty. We have caused physical changes in the regulation of phenomena, 
but we are not those of phenomena. Sovereignty is our delusion. Such a delusion threatens us and, as a consequence, many other living species. We need to know that sovereignty is with you and will always be so. Yours with sorrow, John. Dear nature, we are leaving the European Union. This has made many people angry. Anger radicalises our thoughts and beliefs as the gap between the privileged rich and the forgotten poor becomes ever wider. It seems that we are all retreating to our own frozen islands of belief, a place of comfort for some and dread for others. Do you have a view of sovereignty? The map on our kitchen wall defines borders of belonging, many of which are straight lines. I notice you have a few straight lines in your ecology. Yours, thinking the falcon cannot hear the falconer. John. Dear nature, I can imagine the sheer joy for the earliest of farmers as they produce food to feed themselves and their family. What a triumph of learning through you, a settled relationship. But what happened when the farms produced a surplus? Surplus is a third party in our relationship. It is a place of separation. Surplus food gave the opportunity for trade or sales outside the needs of the community. This is when we fell for the idea that you were, in some way, deficient. Our need for a surplus focused attention on you improving. Efficiency melded in the pressure of a market. We wanted more and more from you. Growing yields belied the damage we were doing. We signed our names in your soils. Perhaps we did not know of this, but we do now. It is a cycle that shows us our deficiencies. It is we that need to improve. We can do better. No more signing in your soil. Yours, John. Dear nature, your soils have been drenched in chemicals and pounded by machines year on year. Hedges have been removed and forests cleared for land. We now know this has had and will drastically reduce your fertility. It is true that we have, in pursuit of increasing yield for food provision, damaged the diversity of the life on the earth. This is not to say that farmers are ignorant of our effects on you, they are not. The problem is that they are caught between earning a living and caring for the natural environment. We need to change this dangerous binary. There are many good farmers. We understand that values of care to the earth can be seen as a commodity, essential and material. We can reward the production of this commodity like any other. We need food and we need care. If we are to survive, we need the two to be bound together forever. Yours, with all manner of binding materials, John. Dear farmers, please try and balance yield with care for the soil. I know it is hugely complex. I know you have to make a living. I know you live in the uncertainty of a relationship with nature. I know it is a precarious balance. I know sustainability is a challenge. I know the conversation may reduce yield. I know reduced yields threatens an increase in the cost of food. I know that. If we carry on as we are, our soils will lose their fertility. I know none of this is easy. I know that between us all, it has to be done. Thank you. Yours, with respect but worried, John. Dear Nature, Last July I voted in a general election. It had been banging on for seven weeks. During that time I can hardly recall any mention of our relationship with you. You would have thought we were neighbours on different continents. I did wonder at the time how we can ever begin to understand where we are. We have to look and think and wonder and talk, 
but that seems to be less important than ensuring the wealthy don't pay too much tax. It's all mind the gap, or more accurately, maintain the gap. Do you know of poverty? Does nature have a working class? Give me strength. So much to quote Keats is nurtured by foppery and barbarism. Sorry, yours finding it hard to avoid foppery and barbarism. John. Dear nature, sometimes I wonder how I know I am here. Yours, John. Dear nature, we have ascribed many virtues to your trees. These are a mixture of material and mystical elements. From healing properties and physical characteristics to trees of a specific magic for ritual and fruits that are bestowed with the power of longevity, trees have been given sacredness by succeeding generations of us. Whilst many of these characteristics are entirely practical observations, strength and flexibility of the wood, for example, many are wonderful imaginative connections between us and trees. These imagined associations are still with us. They evoke memories and senses that are as old as we are, each tree reminding us of a sublime language feeding our imaginative selves. Thank you. Yours, John. Dear nature, imagination is part of us. I can imagine a tree running, a sun talking, cow flying, a soil laughing, a poppy weeping, a cloud shouting, a rhino embroidering, a lawn listening, a river painting, a mountain reading, a place I've never experienced. Recently, we've begun to realise that other species may also be able to imagine. They may dream of places they have been. Perhaps they envisage places they may not have experienced. We know so little of you. I do know, though, that our imaginings will help mend our relationship. Yours, John. Dear nature, stories are very important to my species. We have stories read to us as children. We learn to read. We read stories as adults. Stories are wonderful things. They encourage our imagination. They help us envisage things that are not given to us through our senses. Imagination helps us learn. Our stories of you are animated in ways we choose to construct. Increasingly, I have noticed children books that imagine a better relationship between us and you. Such stories playfully and imaginatively animate situations between the young us and you. I hope, as the young us grow up, we don't forget those early stories. Yours, John. Dear nature, one of the things I most like to do is change something into something else. Children do this all the time. A cardboard box becomes a place for treasures or a house or anything else that the imagination can conjure. I do wonder if that sense of transformation and play comes from our sense of you. When we play our games of imagining transformations, are we playing in parallel to you? whose continual transformation constructs our environment. Is it your ecologies that work through our play? Yours, John. Dear Nature, the 21st of December 2017 was the winter equinox. The geometries between the lengths of the day and the night have been touchstones for many generations. As species, we have delineated meanings between shadows cast in sunlight and those cast in moonlight. One seems to be of growth and work, and the other seems to be of death and romance. In our 24-7 society, I wonder if this important sense of your geometries, of light, is somewhat subdued. It was, and may continue to be, a time when astronomical phenomenon connects to our sense of you. I guess we have built our own lights, that dull the shadows of the moon. Yours, John. Dear Nature, 
Anne came back from her last session studying John Milton's Paradise Lost. She'd concluded that there can be no hope in heaven. This was an entirely logical conclusion from Milton's masterpiece. Heaven is a place where hope is not needed. I was wondering if your complex ecology holds hope within it. I assume all living things in your domain must hope all the time, for food, shelter, weather and all that helps in survival. These are hopes that my species seems to share with you. Do you ever hope my species would go away? Yours, John. Dear Nature, this winter Anne and I have been feeding birds with all kinds of seeds and mixtures. We enjoy watching the birds feed and, on occasion, the braver birds hop up the steps to our kitchen door and peer at us, peering at them. It is a strange kind of communication, lost somewhere in our ancient selves, but it does feel real. I have noticed the blackbirds always eat the seeds on the ground from the edge to the center. My species learns from such tiny observations. It is said that we haven't understood that we are part of you and your learnings tell us that if we damage you, it will hurt us. It is not a difficult proposition after all. Yours, John. Dear Nature, there have been times when a phenomena of yours takes my breath away. I have responded by trying to take a photograph. When I see the picture, it is frequently disappointing as it doesn't illustrate the visceral feeling I had whilst experiencing the event. We know and recall where we are because we experience a variety of sensory information. To focus on a single image impoverishes the recollection we lose other associations coalesced within our memory. Lately I have observed people visiting a place often keep their smartphone in their hand to take a picture of where they are. These devices seem to hardly ever leave their eye as places are captured. I can't think that this helps us to remember where we were or are. If we recall experiences in the context of their environments, then constantly taking pictures constricts our memory of the place, even event or phenomena. We end up with a strangely glazed view of our environments and the places within them. We are in danger of forgetting that every place, event and phenomena is held within an environment of you, a dangerous amnesia. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I've been thinking about being in a place, but not knowing where you are. I walk a lot and enjoy just looking at where I am. On many of these walks, I've been surprised at how many people I see are reading from or communicating through smartphones. Their gaze seems to be at a fixed angle to the device. Undoubtedly, these technologies are great tools for us all, but what environments are they creating? As I walk, it feels like other people are connected away from where they are. Perhaps our technologies have created an environment where our cognition responds to this environment to the detriment of being in the physical environment. Trees are not seen, landscapes forgotten, as we become immersed in other communities and social landscapes. The danger of this is that it widens the gap between us and you. If part of our evolution is adapting to changes in the environment, then what does it mean to be living in a largely digital space? We can adapt more and more to this space, but it may mean we forget to see and feel the place where we are. I think we need to know where we are. Yours, trying not to be lost, John. Dear Nature, how do you share information? Is information part of your ecology? As I watch the birds feeding, I have recognised information being shared accurately amongst all the various species I have observed. Is this specific only to the space outside our kitchen door? Or does this learning spread to all similar situations? 
I ask only because my species shares and replicates any modification of behaviour rapidly and accurately. Ironically, this is why our technological and cultural endeavours are very advanced. I say ironical because it is this very advance that has shown us our folly in the way we have treated you. So, so sorry. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I think it true that we need new or newly remembered values within a shrinking set of values within our ecology. Two places, the gallery and the garden, help me see some possibilities. The gallery and the garden are habits of learning. Each place brings a sense of challenge and wonder. Each place helps us see the world differently. Each place makes connections between themselves and us. Each place shares its possibilities as a social space. Both places encourage us to understand our relationship with our environments, both past, present and future. The gallery and the garden are generous places. They connect us to ourselves and to you. For me, they are places where newly remembered values are debated and evolved. In our ecology of values, there are environments that are significant to many. As places of learning, they should be the heart of all our curricula, schools for our common needs to free our thinking and better connect us with you. I like galleries. I like gardens. I hope you do too. Yours, John. Dear Nature, a few summers back, I watched a large vixen stalk warily in our garden. She was joined by a number of small cubs. She found herself a spot to lie down and began to feed her cubs. This felt special to me. She seemed completely at ease, lying in our garden. It felt like she knew she was safe in this place. A year before this incident, I had spent much time in my garden, growing and making works from Jersey kale, walking stick cabbages. It had been a project where I felt very connected to this space. The fox incident was mesmerizing, but extraordinarily beautiful. For months, the vixen brought her cubs into the garden to play. Nearly every day that summer, in the last hours before dusk, the foxes arrived and played, completely joyous. So it was that the play of foxes punctuated the liminal hours of Anne's and my gaze. This was a gift that connected us with you. Yours, John. Dear Nature, how do we learn about you? We are in and of you. Your effects teach us. We see them, we smell them, we hear them, we touch them. My species writes about you. From books and climatology to guides on gardening, we are rapid to communicate your complexity. Our libraries are full of works about you. As such, we can respond to social and ecological changes through our enormous cumulative culture. I remember the first seeds I planted. I found the process of this tiny seed becoming a plant and trancing. It helped me build a relationship of sorts with you. I learnt a new language from this and many other experiences of you. It is learning that deepens our love. Thank you. Yours, John. Dear Nature, do you have a sense of value in all your complexity? We humans use the world value a lot. Mostly we are referring to the value of money. We exchange things for money. We are enthusiastic for ownership of many things. We can own land. We can buy and own a forest or a mountain or most things in your dominion. This is an individual ownership that can and does exclude others. How strange. I suppose there are similar territorial borders with other species. It just feels like, with us, that we are in danger of not seeing the woods for the money. We have forgotten where we are. Yours, John. Dear landowner, I've recently been chatting to nature. 
I was wondering if you couldn't see the wood for the money. Hope you can see the woods. Yours, John. Dear nature, I live in a society that loves other animals and chooses to adopt some as pets. Mainly dogs and cats, but many other species are brought into people's lives. It has been proven that a pet will give a sense of well-being. Pets are good for us. I think we enjoy the sense of control and requited love that we perceive in these animals. I guess it's the simplicity of the relationship that delights us. It is also a society that seems to love growing things in gardens and allotments. Maybe our loves of gardening and pet ownership are tiny ways of beginning to connect with you. Both are relationships that remind us we we'll live with others within our realm. Yours, John. Dear Nature, Recently, there has been a debate about sentience in other species of animals. This has largely revolved around issues of animal welfare. Sentience is deemed as necessary for the ability to suffer. Those that suffer should be given rights. By all accounts, you have been suffering. Should you not be given rights? Our ideas of your welfare are entirely for our own good as a species. One day, we will be able to prove that you do experience our world subjectively. When I walk in the environment, I sense a vast intelligence that spins around every step I might make. I cannot imagine a non-sentient nature. Sentience is also seen as a metaphysical quality of all things that require respect and care. My species needs more than ever to sense sentience in all living things. If we truly did that, we could change our world. Yours, with care and respect, John. Dear Nature, the mayfly lives for 24 hours. The Methuselah tree lives for up to 5,000 years. We live for an average of 79 years. Do you grieve loss? I have read that animals seem to sense death. Anne and I walked a dog called Rupert for a couple of years because our friend Bob was terminally ill. It was clear to us that the relationship was important to both Rob and Rupert. We noticed Rupert reacting to Bob's illness, especially during Bob's final months. Rupert became anxious to get back to Bob after a walk. He seemed depressed at times and definitely sensed Bob's illness. What became apparent through our experience of watching the relationship with Bob and Rupert was that our human subjective sense of living in the world was not exclusive to us. Other species share common feelings. I think we used to know this, but have forgotten much of what we knew. When we clear your land or radically change your habits, I think you may grieve. I'm sorry. Yours, lost in the cloud of unknowing, John. Dear Nature, I've just been reading about the sixth mass extinction of animals. By many accounts, we are in this new extinction phase now. Other species are becoming extinct a hundred times faster than they would without the impact of humans. Populations of wild animals have more than halved since 1970, while the human population has doubled. This is a profoundly worrying sum. We have done so much damage in ignorance. There is no excuse for our behavior now. This is biological annihilation. Words fail me. Yours, dismayed by the arithmetic, John. Dear Nature, in my society, we have markets where goods of all kinds are exchanged for money. We also use the term to describe an area or space whereby people engage in exchange within a variety of systems social relations and institutions. Much is made of choice available to us within these markets. The general sense is that the more choice for us in these markets, the better. This leads to a huge amount of stuff and services. The problem is that they are exchanged for different amounts of money. Those with wealth have a much greater choice than others. 
choice is good for those who can choose. We have a choice to respect and care about our relationship with you regardless of privilege and monetary wealth. Just saying, yours, John. Dear Nature, when your forests are cleared, or your rivers dammed, or your hedges cut, do you remember how they were? I am always amazed by how quickly vegetation comes back to those places. Are such sites of loss forever marked by what was? A kind of natural cartography? I would love to think that your memory holds and folds your history of all places across all times. What a read that would be. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I love digging your soil. I love the smell, texture and colour of it. I love what it is what it sustains. I've met many experts on soil who told me of its incredible complexity and beauty. They understand its structure through astounding magnifications and rigorous analysis. They have huge amounts of knowledge and apply this for the good of everyone. But despite, or maybe because of it, their knowledge they also say they love the smell, texture and colour of soil. I find it encouraging that this is shared in common. Yours, John. Dear plant scientist, do you enjoy germinating and watching trees and plants grow? I really hope you do. Yours, John. Dear nature, my species has developed an economic system called capitalism. Capitalism is a system and ideology based upon private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. It is possibly the last of our ideologies that remains. When your forests are cut down, it is more often than not in order to capitalise your space. The more I think about it, the more I see that it is this pursuance of profit and subsequent wealth that has moved our gaze away from where we are. Such is the entrenchment of this system that many people think there is no alternative to it. I am wondering if capitalism is a viral ideology embedded in the evolution of my species. I say this only because I think capitalism means that the pursuit of wealth and individual ownership has supplanted our pursuit of well-being and care for our environment. Capitalism has shrunk the choice of values within our communities. We are a clever and creative species and can think with great imagination, but alternatives to capitalism are seen to be beyond us. They don't need to be. We could learn from you. What a mess. What to do. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I'm sure we need a new way of acknowledging what are essential needs between us and our essential values in our relationship with you. The problem with our current system of currency and rewards is that it is unable to extract itself from larger global systems of capital. Currently, the money is a token or a promise that is subject to an old system of industrialised production and consumption. The connected between currency and global profits does not allow for money to be given against the production, say, of better soil or cleaner air or a better community. I am not an economist, but I sense that if we can develop a system that rewards actions and works that are of greater value to all people, then we may be able to unblock the debilitating model where profit and yield cannot be separated and are subject to an outmoded singular e economic model. I think we could develop microeconomies of value that may help us being to revalue our relationship with you and ecology of values to emerge in a way that helps us and you. Our future may depend on small, independent and localised economies based on ecologies of value for the many. Yours, sensing we need a new economic model, John. Dear Nature, wealth creation is a good thing, 
it gives us an opportunity to share the wealth. Our problem is that the distribution of wealth has become increasingly poor. We have forgotten to share with others. The gaps between poor and wealthy have been so vast that our species may feel that its constituent groups live on different planets. Sharing is at the core of making us a social group of animals. It helps us learn and grow as a species. The need to share has been in us for thousands of years. Sharing connects us. Income brings opportunities. Opportunities are what all people of the world need. It has been suggested that giving everyone an unconditional universal income would be a way of beginning to narrow the gaps between our wealth and consequent opportunities. Studies have shown that an unconditional income will encourage people to create more possibilities. This would help in our welfare. We all need to be needed for something. In forgetting to share our wealth, we may also have forgotten that your distribution shares all with it. I hope yours can be the example to us. Yours, hoping we wake up and smell the poverty. John. Dear nature, I have just walked into a tree. I cut my forehead quite badly. I had been thinking about these letters. I laughed. I hope you did too. Yours bloodied and laughing, John. Dear nature, you are probably getting fed up with all this mail. I think I write them to clarify my thoughts, to better understand my relationship within you. We have a shrinking ecology of values. Money is embedded in our private, singular worlds as the core aspirant and measure of survival. Meshing this value with our own evolutionary traits has been a disaster for our relationship within you. I think I can say that the terrible gap between us and you is beginning to shrink as more and more of us do try to understand the importance of you. But it remains a precarious balance. Yours, John. Dear nature, as part of my work, I have grown many plants and trees. Each one has given me a great sense of a co-relationship between it and me. The slow time observation of these growing forms teaches me much and focuses my sense of where I am. I greatly enjoy the geometry of the growth of each plant or tree. Each form twists and spins with the actions of soil and sun. On a winter's day, I can just stand under a tree and feel the spin. On a spring day, I can just stand under a tree and feel its pulse. On a summer's day, I can just stand under the tree and feel the energy being released. On an autumn day, I can just stand under a tree and feel the slow slide to sleep. Your spin, pulse, energy and sleep are shared in us. Thank you. Yours, John. Dear nature, why do I like gardening so much? Is it the fresh air? Is it seeing plants growing? Is it watching how the sun moves across the garden? Is it the sense of slow time? Is it being able to know where and when is best to plant seeds? Is it watching squirrels, foxes and birds using the same space and place? Is it imagining the language between species? Is it touching, smelling and digging soil? Is it watering the garden? Is it cutting the grass? Is it sensing a mysterious and unknown language beneath our feet? Is it looking closely? Is it that it makes me feel and think better? Is it some sense of a co-relationship of care? Is it feeling in some small way connected? I really don't know, but I enjoy it. Yours, John.
Dear Nature, you once told me that weeds do not have Latin names. Not sure this is true. I guess some of our gardens have the class of classification at work. Strange that we view weeds as something undesirable. They are wild plants. True, they grow where they are not wanted and compete with cultivated plants. Good for them. In a society that adheres to the cultivated in most things, weeds seem to me to be the mavericks of our gardens. I like weeds. Come on, weeds. Yours, John. Dear Common Gardener, I've been writing to nature. Thank you for all your digging and bending and planting and thinking. As you rub in the ralgex and sweep the dirt from the kitchen floor, remember the folds of soil on your spade. They're the folds of another language given freely for us to learn. Keep digging. Keep learning. Yours, John. Dear Nature, we enjoy patterns. Humans of all ages love drawing patterns. Some patterns are repeated across cultures and are sometimes seen as codes for being in the world. They are kind of language. When these patterns become uncertain, we experience moments of stress, fear, frustration and sometimes anger. It is no different when your patterns appear to be inconsistent with our assumptions. When th spring is late or winter seems to go on and on or summer brings rain and cloud, we feel the impact. In an atavistic response, some of us will feel the unpredictable weather is associated with something we may have done. Our distant ancestors knew of this. Often these irregular patterns are viewed as your inconsistency, climate seen as something forever other. In our frustration, we blame you. We think we can't change the weather, but we have. Acknowledging that we have an impact on your patterns is not new. We forgot this as rationalism superseded our subjectivity. Our contemporary selves can now see rational evidence for our impact. We are coming full circle in our relationship with you. With impact comes responsibility. Yours, hoping for a greater responsibility from all of us, John. Dear Nature, I've been looking at other words commonly associated with you. Outside is one of the most common. This word does point to you being seen as a side or outside of us. The anthropological technique of participant observation is a method I am aware of in my own work. It suggests being at the edge of things while simultaneously being in the centre. I think in our relationship with you, we have moved away from participant to observer. If we become non-participant observers in our relationship to you, we become strangers, so to speak. Further, we become strangers without a stake in the relationship. Perhaps this has happened. Recently, I came across a phrase to have skin in the game. As I understand this, it means to have incurred risk by being involved in achieving a goal. We need to have skin in the game of better understanding our relationship with you. More skin, more participation. Yours, John. Dear Paul Crutzen, I have been writing to nature. Thank you for using the term Anthropocene as a geological period denoting significant human impact on the Earth's geology and ecosystems. In naming this epoch, you gave identity to our impact. I hope and believe that your naming of this geological period has brought us more skin into the game with regard to our relationship with nature. We are now participants in this relationship. Your word has stopped us being strangers. Yours, John. Dear Nature, a common phrase used by us is getting on in life. We like the weather to be determined by and large by seasonal changes. We want a sense of predetermined rhythm to our climate. 
Through our actions, we have increased the levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. In doing so, we have affected the effects of natural phenomena. These changes impact on all of us and require that people take action. In our relationship with you, we seem to have perpetuated a double bind. On one hand, we need better care for the environment. On the other hand, that care means we have to radically change our values. Our getting on in life becomes a conflicted message. This condition of a social, economic and cultural schizophrenia requires us to radically rethink how we are in the world in relation to you. If we don't, I fear it will not end well. We need to move from getting on in life to getting on with life, where life refers to you. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I have been thinking about the time recently, particularly in regard to our relationship with you. When we reenact an event from our history, we are performing it outside the context of time. A renewed consciousness of you has generated a desire for a closer connection. The relationship has been associated with a spectrum of benefits from well-being to the survival of our species. When we grow foods in our allotments or forage in your landscapes or dig the earth in our gardens, we are reenacting a perceived relationship to you. I am not so sure. I think our relationship to you may alter in emphasis at times, but by and large, I think we still share the fears and desires of our hunters, gatherers and farmers in relation to you. These genetic ghosts may change the emphasis of our relationship, but they are touchstones in that relationship. I see activities like foraging, gardening, tending allotments as initiation dances in our relationship to you. I think the problem is we have forgotten to dance, but are, perhaps, beginning to remember. Yours, dancing in many places, John. Dear Nature, like many people, Anne and I enjoy picking blackberries. Every year we go to a place we know that has an abundance of these fruits. Foraging has become more and more popular in our society. It seems to be a behaviour that fills a need. Maybe it's an echo of our hunting and gathering ways, when we primarily depended on wild food to survive. Maybe it's a need to pick food directly from a place we have discovered for ourselves. Maybe it's a need to experience eating foods at source. Maybe it's because the food eaten is free of our associations with cost. Strangely liberating. Maybe it's because we are so used to thinking of nature that it is owned that we see foraging as an act of defiance, a kind of natural theft. It is a theft that shows just how far away from you we have grown. We see you as not of us. Our blood-red blackberry-stained hands are signs of what we were. We enjoy reenacting our behavioural ecology. These may be rehearsals of what we once were, but what we were is what we are now. Much has changed, but our essential cells need to connect to you. Yours, rehearsing in the now, John. Dear nature, love is a word often used by my species. It's a word that advocates absolute trust in a relationship. You can love something, but that love may not be reciprocated. Love is commonly viewed as an emotion, an intense feeling of deep affection for someone. Whilst it may be an emotion, I think it's principally a state of mind associated with actions in relation to our being in the world and being in the world with others. It's an enacted emotion of great importance to us. It is, perhaps, our greatest achievement. It may be we give the word significance because it requires trust and we find trusting anything so very difficult. We struggle to trust each other to act lovingly is not as easy as it may seem. When something or someone we have trusted confounds that trust, it can be devastating to us. 
things fall apart. Imagine if your spring didn't come or your rains did not arrive. Or trust and maybe a love for you turns into anger brought on by fear. This is no excuse for our behaviour towards you, but it's a kind of truth. We want to trust you, but forget that means trusting ourselves. We are part of you. Yours, John. Dear nature, I've been thinking more about love and you. Your regulation of phenomena means energy cannot be destroyed but can only be transformed from one form to another. Yours is the regulation of all that was and all that becomes. We are one of those energies. Much as we seem to think we are a separate entity outside of your regulation, we are not. We may destroy ourselves, but the energy will be transformed in form. I find a strange comfort in that thought. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I have heard the government are planning to create a database on how much money a student earns after completing a degree. Each course subject within each university will be part of this list. It will be a ranking of subjects studied in terms of future wealth. I assume the government believes such a list will inform the choices for new applicants. We seem to want or need to monetize everything. Monetary value has subverted our own understanding of our needs and desires that were once not associated with such a value. Monetary exchange and transactions have become the dominant institution that folds all subjects into it, tending to give value only to its significance as a market. The value of subject knowledge becomes increasingly lost. Learning, with its acquisition of knowledge, is one of our great assets and joys as a species. To narrow the value of such learning to the value of wealth generation alone is utterly sad, a terrible mistake. Value needs to liberate itself from money. Yours, feeling a bit grumpy, John. Dear nature, our garden has large hedges along its borders. The hedge is the habitat for many birds and other animals. In the evening, I often watch families of birds going in and out of our hedge, a joy to watch. Hedges are important. They support large percentages of out woodland birds, mammals, butterflies and frogs, newts and other species. It is estimated that in a six year period between 1984 and 1990, hedgerow length in England declined by almost a quarter. This accounted for the removal of 5,903 miles of hedge each year. Over the last six years, that is a distance of 35,418 miles of habitat. That's a very, very long hedge and a terrible loss of habitat. We need to plant more hedges. Yours, John. Dear farmers everywhere, Please plan more hedges. Prashou pa so denke do go givat varu. Thank you. Yours, John. Dear nature, you have areas within your domain that are uncultivated and uninhabited by us. We call these wildernesses or wild land. These are places where we can experience you without the signs of us. I've stood in uninhabited land and reflected on what it is to be human. I have stood looking out to sea and reflected on what it is to be human. Visiting the wild lands and wild seas engender reflections on our relationships with you and others. It takes us into a temporal zone where your slow time merges momentarily within us. These moments are important to our ecology of values. Our ecology of values is important to our relationship with you. We lose these moments at great expense to us and to you. We've destroyed a tenth of your remaining wilderness in the last 25 years. There may be none left within a century. Yours, lost for words once more, John. Dear Nature, 
Sometimes I think I only know I'm here when I become estranged from here. Yours, saddened, John. Dear nature, the weight of the earth has changed relatively little throughout its existence. In the first law of conservation, its mass is constant in spite of physical or chemical changes that may happen. In the second law of conservation, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is estimated that 40,000 tonnes of dust a year from our solar system become part of the matter of our Earth. Everything on Earth is formed of the dust that was produced by unimaginable events in our solar system. You and I share the same matter. Mass is constant and energy cannot be destroyed. Perhaps we need a third law of conservation. Human energy and mass can be changed by the consequences of environments that have been destroyed by humans. Has to be said. Yours, John. Dear Nature, it is estimated that 100.5 billion of us have died on your earth. That's a lot of ghosts on your soils. Sometimes my shadow alone touches you. The rest of me is lost somewhere else. Trying to find where here is. Trying to find what here is. Trying to find why here is. There are a lot of ghosts on your soils. Yours, John. Dear nature, in your biosphere, all matter is recycled as a basis for the elemental cycles in our ecosystems. Energy flows from these moving from concentrated forms to more dissipated forms. We are here. Perhaps we don't know where we are because we want to be somewhere else. Our restless selves have conjured many special places that are exclusive to us and outside of you. The problem is that we take these great manifestations of our imaginative longings for our own islands of paradise take our attention away from where we are. Such islands have created some of our greatest cultural works in our history. It would be silly not to value them. They are our sense of our spiritual selves made evident in the most beautiful ways. It is just that I sense that if we spent more time being where we are, we would understand that where we are is the most extraordinary, beautiful and sublime place. Where we are does generate great cultural works of our spiritual selves in and of this place. It may be in our nature to look elsewhere, but that very nature can make us lost in our relationship to you. Yours, trying to be there, John. Dear nature, just been watching the refuse collectors pick up our rubbish for recycling. Watching them, I was reminded of you. A weekly ritual that felt like a small act in an elemental cycle. All matter is recycled. Thanks, bin men and bin women. Yours, John. Dear Nature, this morning I listened to a short news item about your seas and oceans. The report made it clear that we know very little about the beds of your oceans and seas. We love finding out about unknowns and bring wonderful knowledge to the world. I was excited to hear this. As a species, we need to explore, and exploring your mysteries is another way of us connecting. But then, the review highlighted the fact that we could exploit the oceans and seas for minerals, oils, gas, and anything new we discover in the future. It was that word exploit that made my heart sink. It is no different from the word subdue found in Genesis. What does everything we find out about have to be exploited? Can we really exploit sustainably? Can we really subdue sustainably? I can see a time when your seas and ocean beds are crisscrossed with the borders of countries claiming ownership, another sad map of sovereignty. We have signed in your soils, and now we will sign in your ocean beds. Such a terrible conceit. What to do? Yours feeling estranged and ashamed once more, John. Dear nature, we are not neighbours, we do not visit you, we are not separate from you, we are not elsewhere, we are here. 
Please help us to understand this. Yours, without maps, John. Dear Nature, the sun is shining this morning. It has been a dark and long winter. When the sun shines, we seem to feel better in the world. You store sunlight as chemical energy in your organ compounds. That includes us. Light is at the heart of many of our rituals, beliefs and narratives. Its presence and absence has flowed through our stories across the myriad of spoken languages. Many of our stories connect us to you as poetic renditions of our experiences of you. They have been passed down the generations in oral and written traditions. Many of these works do have in them our struggle to form our relationship with you. Perhaps it has always been a struggle for us. Light and its absence remain the common metaphor of the good and the bad of our behaviour. Many of our stories tell us of our moral connections with you, both as warnings and ethical measures. The sun is shining this morning. Yours with more energy, John. Dear Nature, as antidotes to our mortality, we often make places of our imaginative longings. Entrance to these places of eternity is often granted, or otherwise, as a judgment on our behaviour in life. We conflate our death with access to spaces we have constructed, each space bringing joy or pain depending on the bounces at the gates. It can be argued that such places encourage good behaviour or discourage bad behaviour in our lived lives. We are social animals. I think we want to live good lives. Our need to be needed is part of that behaviour and is adopted by the many. Better to be a good person in the here and now in the knowledge that our deaths are part of an incredible system of us within you. When we die, our matter is recycled and our energy flows, a slow and widening river across the biosphere. What a place to be in and part of forever. Our energy swallowed in the breath of another animal or gathered in the leaves of a tree or rain from a cloud or floating on the ocean's floor. An eternity in a place of great wonder. A paradise of sorts. Not sure about the bouncers. Yours, John. Dear Nature, I am sure many of my species have stood and looked at your landscapes and breathed deeply, reflecting on beauty. Such slow, quiet moments are a vital principle in our well-being. Some would call this a spiritual right. Spirituality is necessarily ambiguous. The ambiguity allows a freedom for all in what they sense as spiritual. For many, gazing at your landscapes and experiencing your phenomena are acts of sacred reflection. We can feel tiny within the world while simultaneously feeling a vital connection to it. We sense that we are needed in that connection. Being needed for something is important for all of us. We express this necessity in many parts of our lives. In truth, we know you do not need us, but we do need you. Whilst what we have done to you is terrible, it may be that in our struggle to try to coexist with you, we find that need. We are at least talking. Yours, John. Dear nature, spring has begun to stutter into our garden. Life emerging from your soils and gathering on your trees is a force that we all feel. Soon the trees will be covered in their blossoms, ticked on in your time. We long for this. A strange relief comes to us. It is happening again, and again is a word we hold dear. Repeated and repeated, your clock is our most loved measure of where we may be. Rituals of old and of now play in us, ticking in your time. Spring has begun to stutter into our garden and it makes us feel better. Yours, John.
Dear Nature, things are looking up. There are many conservation projects around the world that are trying to restore habitats. People are beginning to be more conscious of you and our relationship to you. This could be seen as restorative justice as we begin to try to undo some of what we have done. Restoration and conservation are twin actions that meld our ecologies in a possible symbiosis. It is hugely paradoxical that we cause a change in your climate, show evidence of ourselves in your soil, and are instrumental in a mass extinction of other species, and then create a perception that we are needed as we try to put our mistakes right. But now is a time for pragmatism, as we restore and conserve places that are you. It may just be a pragmatism that changes our sense of both us and you. Yours, hopefully, John. Dear Nature, in our kitchen we have a map of the world and a map of the UK. Maps are beautiful things, but I've always felt wary of them. I think this is because they present us with a world delineated in exquisite detail, whilst being a reminder of how we have subdued the earth. I have had a constant tick in the back of my mind that a map is not the territory, yours is the territory. Knowing where we are is complicated. Yours, trying to be where I am, John. Dear nature, it has been snowing. I watch the landscape out of my window, slowly being blanketed in a whiteness that muffles all it falls on. It was a beautiful picture. I had to leave this view to get some food. It was cold with a ferrous wind and I struggled to walk to my local shop and back. It was a very different experience to watching the flakes of falling snow earlier. It felt physical and real and I was happy to have walked in it. There has been a large rise in technologies that mediate our experience of you. Digital augmentations and simulations of you are very popular. My worry is that these technological natures are entirely controlled by us. They may be the nature we have always wanted, but my emotional need for you include the challenges, unpredictability and wildness of you. I do not want to experience you only through glass. I want to live in your risks and dangers. Yours viscerally, John. Dear nature, we've changed the climate. We are under the weather. We've changed our climate. We are under our weather. Yours, John. Dear nature, I have been thinking about your language. It seems to be of decay and death and growth and renewal and light and dark and heat and cold and wind and birds and earth and mud and fields and hills and seas and rivers and mountains and colors and plants and trees and hedges and skies and eyes and roots and leaves and whirlwinds and cows and monkeys and gold and emeralds and so much more. It is a language in which I have yet to become fluent, but I'm trying. Yours, John. Dear Nature, my species has always mimicked aspects of you, notably rituals, where the wearing of costumes or the actual skins of other animals are performed. This is an old need to try and possess the attributes of other species, mimicking to inhabit that species and transfer their characteristics to us. We mimic to transfer attributes. Now we are learning to mimic your ecological wonders. Biomimicry applies what we learn from close observations of you to our built environments. It is a transfer that connects your attributes to us. At the very least, it is an acknowledgement that we can learn from you. Yours, John. Dear Nature, people are using less water in their baths. 
People are travelling more on public transport. People are recycling more things. People are planting trees. People are restoring habitats. People are clearing rubbish from their environment. People are reducing their carbon footprints. People are trying to live sustainably. It is the accumulative actions, however small, of people that will change our relationship with you. Small solidarities from us. Yours, a person, John. Dear Nature, in all evolution, adaptive traits are functional, evolved through natural selection. Each trait is understood as causing fitness to increase, where the genes of future generations are better adapted to their environment. I think that, given that you are our environment, our species should evolve traits that adapt to you. This may already be happening as we see the effects in our actions. We have the knowledge to understand the risks to our future generations. This could be good news as we struggle to read our relationship to you. Adaptive traits may be the restorative justice you need. I don't know how many generations of us it will take for these traits to be adopted into our genes, but my heartfelt hope is that we will evolve them as a matter of our survival. Yours, John. Dear Nature, what to do? We need a revolution in our behaviours and attitudes towards you. We need to care and bring restorative justice to you. We need to make clear, through education, social interactions, global trade and many other agencies that we are living with you and we have a stake in your welfare. We need to understand that being in you with all our senses is better than an augmented version of you. We need to develop our technologies to help meet these needs. We need to be needed and remember where we are. We need to understand that in our ecology of values, our actions towards you are fundamental. We need to know your welfare is our welfare. Yours with hope, John. Dear Nature, a lament, we were lovers, your unknowns folded us in fear and wonder. We signed our names in your soil lost in our clearing and clearings. Our shadows alone touch you, trying to find where here is. Wanting here to be elsewhere, we became estranged. I am sorry, but perhaps we are moving towards knowing what here means. Yours, John. Dear Nature, our stardust selves are restless. We are keen to move. When our moving vans become rockets, we will be swapping biophys. Several science and space exploration laboratories are working on growing plants in differing habits. We have learned much about our plant behaviors from your ecology. We want to mimic such behavior in other atmospheres. From moon plants to lunar greenhouses, we are going to take our gardens to other planets. In so doing, we are echoing your biological system in the process of settling in a new habitat. Whether we settle on a new planet as a necessity of survival or to test possibilities, it will be the knowledge you have given us that we take with us. Thank you. On the side of each rocket, Emblazoned with bold letters are the words, don't do that again. We need to remember. Yours, John.
Dear nature, I love the unknowns of you. Yours, John.